Thank you, Jesus. Let's open our Bibles to Job 4. We'll read verse, no, Job 3. Job 3. We'll read verse 24. I'll read verse 25 and verse 26. Then in unison, we are going to read Psalm 27. In unison, we are going to read Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Because of time, because we have some exercise that we want to do, I'll just go ahead and read. Thank you, Jesus. Job 4. Job 3 from verse 25. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. I repeat, for the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Let's go to Psalm 26. In Psalm 26, we are going to read together in unison. Probably we use this together. 27, yes, 27. Psalm 27, we are going to read from verse 1 to, I think it's verse 14. All right, are we ready to read? Let's do it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength and my life. On whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise up against me, even this I will be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret places of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. And then shall mine head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yeah. I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saith, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy first Lord will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, for false weakness you have raised up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Did I would have fainted unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he should strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's stretch our hands towards the altar. And let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you. We just want to bless your holy name. We want to thank you for the word that you're going to release in this place. We want to thank you for your presence. Lord, all what we need in this place is your presence. As long as you are with us, 
as long as you're present with us, we are more than conquerors through Christ who is our Lord and our Savior. So we just want to thank you, Father, that you are our strength. Even in this month of Ada, you are our strength. Be our strength, O oh Lord, as we go out, as we come in. Be our strength as we are in town or out of town. Be our strength, O oh Father, throughout the days of our lives. Take away every fear from our hearts, O oh God, and replace that with courage, with strength, and with boldness, with your love. We thank you, Lord, and we bless your name in the name of Jesus. Now I pray, O oh Father, for every hand that stretches to this altar. May they eat from the altar. Those who work in the altar, they eat from the altar. May they get a breakthrough from this altar because of your name. This altar represents your presence, O oh God. May your presence be upon your people. We thank you, Lord, and we bless your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You are welcome to the house of the Lord. If you are new and it's your first time to worship with us, we are going to recognize you at the end of the service. But feel free, you are in the house of your Father of the Lord, so feel free to just enjoy yourself. Because of time, today I'm going to speak on the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear. And we are going to do some exercise at the end. We are going to do some exercise at the end. And for those who are just coming, who came a little bit late, there is some paper that you have been given, which is some list of things that we typically are afraid of. We want to address those things in our prayer today. And we are going to pray over those things. The spirit of fear. Today, I would want us to learn about fear and also to pray about fear. The Bible teaches us two types of fear. It teaches us how many types of fear? Two types of fear. One type is good fear. It is a virtue. It is of value. It should be pursued. It is positive. It is clean. It is godly. It comes from the spirit of God. So there's such a fear that is clean, is a virtue, is good, is positive, it's a value. It comes from God, it comes from the Spirit of God. It is called the fear of God. It is called what? The fear of God. Psalms and Proverbs, they talk quite a lot about this type of fear which is Solomon and his father, David. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 9 verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when we fear the Lord, knowledge and wisdom starts to trickle towards us because of the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 8 verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. What is the fear of the Lord? To hate evil. Proverbs 14 verse 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is what? A fountain of life. Then David in Psalm 25 verse 14 he says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And he will show them his covenant. The fear of the Lord is with them. The, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And he will show them his covenant. Psalm 34 verse 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you of the fear of the Lord. Luke 1 verse 50. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Exodus 15, O oh Lord, who is like thee? You are glorious in holiness, and you are fearful in praises. This fear is positive. This fear is clean. Psalm 19 verse 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. This fear that we are talking about, it is the reverence of God. It is to have a reverential awe of God, to venerate God, to respect God, to give him due regard, to tremble in love. This is the first fear. But I'm not going to dwell on this fear today. 
I am going to talk about the other fear. God willing, we may talk more about this fear next week. Today, I would want us to focus on the second type of fear. And that second type of fear, the Bible talks about that very often. There are hundreds of scriptures, uh, over 366 scriptures in the Bible that focuses on this second type of fear. I found some definition from the King James Version Dictionary. It says, fear is a painful emotion caused by an expectation of evil. It is a, what? A painful emotion caused by an expectation of evil or the apprehension of impending danger. Apprehension of impending danger. Fear is kind of in a spectrum. It comes from moderate to severe. So fear is moderate. Dread is more serious. Terror is even worse. Fright is the worst. When people are living in terror or in fright, they have a feeling that the sky is falling. And even when they are walking, they are looking, is there something that is falling on me? You are now living in flight. Fear is accompanied with a desire to avoid the expected evil. It is an uneasiness of the mind upon the thought of future evil likely to befall us. Fear saps our confidence. It takes away our joy. It evaporates our peace. It paralyzes our thoughts and our imagination. This type of fear is not from God. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I want you to look at your neighbor and just verbalize the word power, love, and a sound mind and say, which one do you have? The fear that the enemy of God instills in our hearts is a tendency to disempower us. It steals our joy. It paralyzes our mind. The decisions that we make out of fear are not sound. They are not spiritual nor beneficial to us. Today, I propose to do an exercise on our fears so that as Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, we can pray, we can present our request, and we can petition God that he will guide our hearts and our minds unto peace and liberty in Christ Jesus. In this side of heaven, there are many reasons for us to be afraid. When we hear about wars or rumors of wars, it's a reason to be afraid. We know what's happening in Ukraine right now. We know what's happening in the whole block of Europe. How they are afraid that perhaps this may come to us. The pandemic came, it caused people to be afraid. In Africa, we have a little bit of droughts and people are always afraid. The Israelites were afraid of one thing or the other throughout their generations. At one time, they were afraid of Goliath. They were terrified of Goliath. At another time, they were afraid of the Syrians. There is a time that they were afraid of the Babylonians. They were afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. At another time, they were afraid of Pharaoh. At another time, they were afraid of Haman. At another time, they were afraid of the sons of Anak, the giants. They even defined themselves as grasshoppers. There's a time that they were afraid of Herod. If you look at the life of the Israelites, there was always some fear in their life. Something comes in their life that causes them to be afraid. Life has a tendency of bringing giants. And if you are not very careful, you can live in terror because of the giants that life brings. My paperwork is about to expire. What's going to happen? I may end up going back where I do not want to go back. And you are paralyzed with fear. And the decisions that you end up making, they are not sound decisions. They are not beneficial decisions. For the next 20 years, you are dealing with the decision that you made out of fear. 
There are many reasons that makes us to be afraid. And that fear can drive us to a corner that we are not supposed to be. Or we are supposed to be there so that we can trust in the Lord. But when we are in that corner where we are so much afraid of fear, we make wrong decisions. When God said to the Israelites, it's time for you now to enter Canaan. I've walked with you from Egypt. Remember what happened, the ten plagues. They were there in Egypt, but you were in Goshen. There is nothing. When there was darkness in Egypt, in Goshen there was light. If there was thunderstorm in Egypt, in Goshen, in Goshen there was a breeze. So you saw me. You saw who I am. You saw what happened by the tenth plague. That by the tenth plague, when the firstborn of children and animals of the Egyptians were dying, yours did not. Not only that, I walked with you and we arrived at the Red Sea. And at the Red Sea, I said, Moses, take your staff. And when Moses hit his staff unto the water, I mean, beyond all knowledge of chemistry, the water separated. It defied chemistry and physics. And they had to pass through. And they sang. They knew that only God, the only true God can do this. They knew. But when God, the same God who did this, who provided the manna, who provided them whatever they wanted, who provided them water from a rock, when the same God now says, my children, now is time for you to enter Canaan so that you can possess your inheritance that I have promised to your forefathers, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. It's now time to enter. They mourned, they wailed, and they cried in terror. They refused God's command. They refused God's protection. They refused God's providence. Number one, I want you to write this if you are writing in your notes. Fear can make you to lose your inheritance. Fear can make you to lose your inheritance. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Fear can make you to lose your inheritance and your portion in the land of the living. Your inheritance and your portion in the land of the living. Let me develop this. When the Israelites refused to enter Canaan, God was so angry at them because God had a track record with them. From the time that God sent Moses and Aaron, he showed them that some of the things that happened to them can only happen by God. He showed them who he is to them. He showed them his power. He showed them his authority. He showed them that I am God above all. But when they refused to enter, he swore by himself that those who are 20 years of old and above, we have tested my goodness, but refused to enter, for sure they will never enter. They will all perish in the wilderness of Param at Kadesh Barnea. They will all perish because they have refused to enter. They all perished because they refused to enter. They lost their portion in the land of the living. They lost their inheritance in the land of the living because of... So it's a subject that is very important. And I want us to treat it with sober. I want us to treat it with anger. We want to make sure that we deal with fear today, God willing. Because it can cause you to lose your inheritance. It can cause you to lose your inheritance. I have seen people walking out of their job just before promotion because they just thought that something was telling them that I'm going to be fired. I 
I'm, I'm just, you know, this, this uneasy feeling in me. You know, I had an, a squabble with the dean, or I have a squabble with my boss, or I have a squabble with this person. You know, the email that they wrote me, I think they're about to fire me. I, I'm just going to leave here before your promotion comes. You lose your portion, you lose your inheritance before your time. I know this lady who was going out with this guy for four years. And in the four years of their relationship, everything was okay. Then when the guy talked about now it's time to move on uh, with marriage, when they started now to sit together, now is important stuff. Now is intense stuff to discuss about how this thing is going to go. And the lady is saying, oh, you know, I would want, you know, to invite these people and these people and these people. And the guy was saying, no, we don't want to make this thing big. You know, in that conversation, uh, they had a little bit of back and forth. And the guy was a little bit disappointed. And he left and he went home. And this lady becomes so terrorized with fear. We are breaking up. We are breaking up. And quickly, she texted it's fine. This is the end of our relationship. And the guy said, what are you talking about? I, I know, I know. I know my heart has told me already. This is the end of our relationship. And for the next 20 years after that, she's not married. Fear. It makes you to lose your portion. It makes you to lose your inheritance. And the more she prayed and she prayed, confirmation was coming that guy was the right guy for him. But because of what? Fear. Number two, fear makes you to run without anyone chasing you. Fear makes you to what? To run without anyone chasing you. Proverbs 28 verse 1. It says, the wicked run away when no one is chasing them. But the godly are as bold as a lion. The godly are as what? are as bold as a lion. When prophet Jonah was afraid of going to preach to Nineveh, he ran away to Tashish, and no one was chasing him. He ran away. I'm going to Tashish. I, can, I cannot go to preach to those people. Those people are so mean. If they see me in the city, probably they are going to kill me. I'm not going to go. Why God has favored those people? God is supposed just to destroy them. And he ran away without anyone Chasing him. When Jacob stole Esau's first bondship and blessing, when, when he just saw Esau around, he was so terrified, he ran away to Angle Laban's house, and he was there for the next 20 years. When David was afraid of Absalom, he ran away for quite a long time. Yet, David used to be so bold. He says that one time I killed a lion, and another time I killed a bear. When David was fighting against his enemies, he says, I hid them as fine as dust. David was a man of valor. He was a man of war. But a small band that was led by Absalom made him so terrified. When you go to read some of the Psalms that David wrote during the time that he was running away from Absalom, you feel pity for him. You can't even think that was this David, a bold lion. Number three. There are few things that fuels fear, that propels fear, that drives fear. One of them is sin. Number two is lack of trusting God. And number three, lack of a prayerful life. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Sin Lack of trust in God and lack of a prayerful life, it fuels fear in one way or the other. I'll explain it. Let me start with sin. When we are in sin, we lose power. When we are living in sin, what do we lose? We lose power, we lose love, we lose a sound mind. Let alone, we lose peace and we lose joy. We lose the confidence to approach God. That confidence of approaching God, we lose that. Whenever the Israelites sinned against God, they lived in fear of their enemies. Because sin removes the protective shield of faith. 
What does sin do? It removes the protective shield of faith. It removes the hedge of protection, God's hedge of protection. And it removes the breastplate of righteousness. It leaves us vulnerable. That's what sin does. It removes that protective shield of faith. It removes the hedge of protection and the breastplate of righteousness. And it leaves us vulnerable. During the period that the Bible calls the judges, God would give the Israelites a judge to lead them. And when they sin, they would go into captivity. And when they repent, they would, God would give them another chance and another judge. So it's a period of close to 200 years where they were being ruled by the judges. And what was happening when they sin? They end up in captivity, and they are wallowing in captivity, and they are crying in captivity, and they are saying, God, help us. When they repent, God give them another chance, and give them another judge. And they live with that judge, and they follow the Lord a little bit, then they sin again. So they had that cycle of sin, repentance, sin, repentance, sin, repentance, and it was not the easiest time in Egypt, in, the, in, in, in Israel, in the whole history of Israel. The time that Israel had reached its bottom line is the time of the judges. The Bible says, during the time of the judges, everybody lives in a way that was good in their sight. There was no king in Israel. So everybody lived in the way that they believe is the best in their own sight, not in the sight of God. And it was the time that they go through a lot. So we had 12 judges, and during these times, they lived in cycles of disobedience and captivity, repentance and freedom, disobedience and captivity, repentance and freedom. Sin attracts God's punishment, and we are afraid of punishment. So when we are living in sin, we live in fear, because we know that sooner or later, punishment is coming our way. We know that we are going to be punished for what we are doing. So you see that the more you live in sin, the more you live in fear. When you are living in righteousness and in love, fear is so far away. When we are living in what? Righteousness and in love, fear is so far away. One thing that fear is so afraid of is holiness. One thing that fear is so afraid of is holiness. When you live a holy life, fear dissipates. Fear runs away. Nehemiah and the builders of the wall of Jerusalem did not run away from all the threats of Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem because they were in right standing with God. Are you following? When you are living in right standing with God, even when a lion comes after you, you are not afraid. So, when you are a person who is so much afraid, afraid of the future, afraid of tomorrow, afraid of failure, afraid of being lonely, afraid of this, afraid of that, check your standing with the Lord. Abraham pursued three kings who kidnapped Lot. And he, he didn't have an army. Three armies. And he overcame them because he was in right standing with God. When David was in right standing with God, he always pursued his enemies, he overtook them, and he conquered them. But the sooner he had this Bathsheba issue, we saw him running away from his own son. So holiness makes fear to run away. But sin makes us to run away. Let me take the another one. Lack of trust in God. It fuels fear. In other words, when your trust is low, your fear is high. There is an inverse relationship right there. When your trust, trust in God is low, your fear is high. When we trust God, you find out that fear runs away. Psalm 56 verse 3 to 4 says, When I am afraid... I put my trust in you. In God, I trust and am not afraid. Psalm 118 verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mortals 
do to me. When you trust God, you do not fear men. When you trust God, you are not afraid of men. You are not afraid of men. I remember one of the times having a conversation with a person who was regarded as my superior at work. And in the meeting, I looked right into the face of the person. I asked, one, two, three, four. So you guys, you have put this police, and you are the first one to mess up this police. And you can't even follow your own police. So now you are asking me to do A, B, C, which is against the police. That, and the person was scared. And that person is supposed to be my boss. Because when you trust God, you are not intimidated. When you trust God, you are not going to be running away without anyone chasing you. When you trust God, you know sometimes God, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, he says, no, 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 no. Don't be even afraid. Well, then they will take you to the kings and to the courts. When you go to the court system, you don't have even to premeditate what you are going to say. Just go. That's what Jesus says. Just what? Go. When you arrive there, then the spirit of God will come upon you and he will tell you what to How many times we have been sleeping on our pillow and the whole night you are thinking, what will I say? So am I going to say this? But if I say this, then they will say that. Then if I say this now, then they will say that. I mean, you try all the questions and all of them, they fail. Then it's early in the morning. You did not sleep well. Because the whole night you were trying to rehearse what to say. When you trust the Lord, there is nothing that can move you. I know sometimes we are so much afraid of witches. Men, the Africans, we are so much afraid of witches. Oh my goodness, am I going to sleep well? Probably there's someone that is just coming to touch me in the night and fear. God did not give us the spirit of fear. Why, why, how about witches afraid of you? Why should you be afraid of them? Sometimes I, I, I challenge my, my family when I see that there's a little bit of fear. Remember, everybody goes through some fear of some sort. I go through some fear of some sort. I remember after uh, some time in, uh, I think it was in 2020, you know, after what was happening in the country and the death of Floyd and stuff. So it was in the, in the middle of the pandemic. So we drove downtown. I think we were going to, uh, during the summer, they do this summer uh, where they, 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 they sell, you know, products from the farms. What is it called? Farmer's Market or something like that. So we went downtown uh, to, 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 to the farmer's market. And when we arrived there, I parked I saw that there was a police who was following me. I understand what was happening in the country. You know, people were so afraid of police and all that good stuff. Not good stuff. Uh, all those stuff that was happening. So police came uh, and parked beside me. Then I drove right to his window. They said, hi, sir. How are you? How are things? And my children were not very comfortable to say it in a nice way. They were just not very comfortable. One of them said, what are you doing? And I said, why should I be afraid of him when I've not done anything wrong? Not only that, the Lord is with me. Who can touch me? Who can successfully touch me and do harm on a child of God? So I said, I say, you know, we are coming here to find the farmer's market. We know that it opens Wednesday and Saturday. And it's closed. Do you know anything that's happening here? And, oh, no, oh, no. I think today they are closed. They are going to open the other day. And, oh, thank you. We drove off. He did not follow us. Because he saw that this person does not have any, is not afraid of me. Why should I be afraid? I have not done anything wrong. And the Lord is with me. The Bible says the one in me is greater. So why should be, I be afraid? I've been in some meetings and the meeting is going on and going on. And I just ask one question and it changes the whole atmosphere. Why should I live in fear when I'm a child of God? When Jesus is in you, 
and you are still afraid, how can you and Jesus together be afraid? I want this to sing in you for a minute. And I know that I'm helping someone right now who has been living in some form of fear and you are afraid of men and you are afraid of this and you are afraid of that. Yet, you profess to be a child of God. I've grown up to see my children becoming bold and bold and bold. And I like it when they are bold because we are children of God. Today we read from Psalm 27. And it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold. Of whom shall I be afraid? Three, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war broke out against me, even then I will be confident. When I read this, I smiled. When war comes against me, that's when I actually become more confident. Because I know that the one in me is greater than the one in the world. I know this battle does not belong to me. At this point in time, this battle is in the hands of the Lord. May the Lord fight this battle for me. And you see the Lord prevailing. You see the Lord prevailing. When I see an army coming after me, that's when I'm actually is confident. So in a nutshell, when our trust in the Lord is high and is solid, our fear is low to non-existent. I want to encourage someone today that trust the Lord with all your heart. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Let me tell you, this is when the Bible was talking about worry, that, you know, why do you worry about what shall we eat? What shall we wear? What shall we do? And you are always worried. Then Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. Actually, it was the, uh, the vultures or the, the ravens. Look at the ravens over there. They do not sow. They do not plant. They do not reap. They don't have silos. They do not store. But yet, have you ever seen a raven dead? If um, your father takes care of ravens, how much more you, the child of God, then he says, look at these flowers, the lilies of the valley. And they look at the lilies. And he says, look, even Solomon, in his greatest splendor, he was not clothed as beautiful as his, these flowers. But tomorrow they will wither and they will dry and they will catch fire. So how much more value is your own life before the Lord? So what makes you to be afraid that what will I eat? What will I clothe? How many of you, since you came to this country, there's one time that you went out naked because you didn't have anything to, buy, to, to, to clothe? Not even a single day, right? Number two, is the cloth that you are wearing today the cloth that you came with when you come from Africa? So, it is evident that God provides. It is evident that God what? Provides. I look at my life the day that I left. It was the 31st of December uh, 2002 when I was leaving Africa to come over here. I had only one bag and a huge jacket. Because someone told me I came in, in January. They said, oh, it's going to be snow. So someone had bought me a huge jacket. I had only one bag. All my belongings, all, everything was there in that little bag. And that little bag was following me. And I'm, I'm going to America. Now if I sit down and try to write the blessings that the Lord has given me in this country, why should I be afraid? Why should I fear if the Lord has taken care of me like this? If I were to go back home tomorrow, I can't put all my things in a bag. So why should I be afraid? If the Lord has taken care of me so much. I mean, when I came to this country, I was single and one. And when I'm going back now, I am four. Why should I be afraid? Why should I be afraid? The Lord is your provider. And he knows that, daughter, I will provide you. The reason why sometimes the Lord does not just give you everything at once 
Just think if you become a millionaire today. Just think if a millionaire today. Some of you, that's the last time that we see you here. <laughs> so God knows that, you know what? I, I'll give you little. I, I'll leave a situation so that you can trust me. So that you can focus on me. That as you focus on me, I give you another little space. It's little space. So he takes you from glory to glory to glory. This is the reason why when the Israelites were just entering uh, Canaan, God did not give them the whole of Canaan at once. He says, I'll give you a part. You fight over a part. Then when you take this part, then you fight the next part. And you take this part, then you fight for the next part. And you take this part, and you continue to fight for your part. Because things that we are given for free, we do not what? Value them. Did you remember the preaching from last week? Things that we are given for free, we don't what? Value them. So God says, no, 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 no. Water I gave you for free in the desert. When you arrive at Mara, I changed the water into, into sweet water. I, I give you for free. Mana, I give you for free. The quails, I give you for free. All those things I give you for free. But now the land of your inheritance, you have to fight for it. Because you can only value that which you fight for. So things that come too easy in life, we don't really, really value them. We don't really, really fight for them. Yeah, Pastor Demis, I didn't come easy. <laughs> she was trying to be very difficult. <laughs> things that come too easy, we don't value them. But things that we kind of sweat a little bit for, things that we kind of fight a little bit for, this is the reason why you spend the whole night studying. Because you fight for that grade. You work hard. So things that you fight for. So God, in his wisdom, he makes us to fight for things. And as we fight, and he knows that you have put your heart into this, you are fighting for it, so I'll give you. So you continue fighting and he continues giving you and you continue fighting. So the life of a Christian is a life of warfare. You fight for your breakthroughs. You fight for your blessings. You fight for your marriage. You fight for your children. You fight for your progress. You fight for everything. And the Lord just says, yeah, I see. You put your heart in it. That's why you are fighting for, for it. Those who are married. <laughs> Someone... I was married, and the husband started to misbehave. And he says, ah, I don't even care. You're not the last born of this world. I can just leave you. Go and go. And the person, of course, went and married another person. And for the next few years, this woman is just crying and crying and crying and crying. Then when he's going for counseling and everything else, he says, so did you ever think of bringing this matter to the church? No. Did you bring this matter to your family? Because when you got married, you gathered a lot of people, right? Did you bring that to the family so that this can be resolved? No. So tell me what did you do? I just chased him out. He didn't fight for what he said. Uh, you think anything good, the devil will not try to take it? Ah, anything good, the devil will try. Those who have children, how many times your children have been suppressed or praised, the enemy trying to kill your children? And what did you do? You fasted, you prayed, you fight for it. Anything that you put your heart into, God fights for that. God gives you. But anything that you just say, I don't even care about it, I walk away. And God says, okay, cheerio. So I'm talking to a generation that are fighters. Generation that are prayer warriors. Generation that are saying, I am not going to eat tomorrow. This situation cannot remain this, like, this way. I am going to pray over this situation. And I'm going to ask them, I'm going to bombard heaven. I'm not going to make heaven rest until Jerusalem is established. I am not going to make heaven rest until my family is established. Until my children are okay. Until this happens. Let me move on to talk about the lack of prayer. It causes a lot of fear. A prayerless life is a fearful life. A prayerless life is a what? A fearful life. When your prayer life goes down, your, your, your fear, if there's something that we can call a fear meter, 
it goes up. The barometer of fear, the fear meter goes up because your prayer life has gone down. You lack boldness, you lack confidence, you lack authority, you lack power. So you are now defeated if you are prayerless. I think they say a prayerless Christian is a what? Is a powerless Christian, right? People who do not fast, meditate on the word of God, live in constant prayer and praise, they are easily moved by very small situations. They are easily moved by what? Very small situations. They are terrified by very ordinary situations. There are those people who feel like the sky is falling over a very small situation. Over a very small situation. I remember when I was still in school, one of the guys had a scholarship and uh, that semester, he did not do well. So they put him on probation. Oh my goodness. He was even thinking of going and throw himself in front of a moving train. Yeah, in real. I'm going to throw myself. How can I go back home like this? What are people going? I mean, he is already seeing a chain reaction of failure. Because he was on what? In probation. And I said, no, but let's pray about this situation. Oh, there's nothing that we can do in this situation. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to transfer to leave this school. I mean, he went on and on and on and said, no. Let's pray about this situation. We, pray, we prayed about this situation. He said, this is what you need to, go, to do. I want you to go to the chair, ask the chair and the dean to have a meeting. And he, as an international student, he was going through some challenges from home. Explained to them, and he had evidence of what he was going through. And he showed them what he was going through and stuff like that and stuff like that. Then they said, oh, we never put that into account. We never even thought. Why did you not share what was happening and blah, 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 blah. And the dean says, no, we need to give you another chance. So study during the break. It was a December break. Then you write these exams again and we'll see what you get. He studied during the December break. Sometime in January, he was given the exams and he excelled. And he was removed from the from probation. Fear. So I want to encourage someone today. Don't be afraid. Fight. Ask the Lord. Let me, let, let me finish up. I, I remember when the, <laughs> the pandemic started. There were those people who were so much afraid. They did not leave their apartments or their homes for months. They were living in their own home. 2020. If homes would complain, they would have complained, you are sitting on me too much. <laughs> I haven't been used to you sitting on me that much. They did not even dare to walk in the neighborhood just to gasp for fresh air. They were paralyzed with fear. Some people never came back to church for fear of the invisible virus. Many churches closed. Many pastors retired and said, we are done. If you find the statistics of 2020, 2021, how I many thousands of churches and pastors who just feel like we are done because of fear. Fear can paralyze you. Fear can actually paralyze you. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. God knows that, we are, that there are reasons for us to be anxious in this side of the world. And he understands that. That's why he says, no, 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 no. no. In every situation, prayer and petition. Once our prayer life is in the right place, anxiety goes. Because you are talking to a higher power than your situation. There is a higher power than your situation. I don't care what situation it is. There is a higher power than your situation. I want you to look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, there is a higher power than your situation. If you know that there is a higher power than your situation, 
You are not a person who's going to be moved by little things, by small things. This lady uh, had a boyfriend. I know a lot of stories of boyfriends. I don't know why. And some situation happened, and the boyfriend says, you know, I, I don't think this is going to work out. So I am moving on because of there was some cheating or something that had happened. <clears throat> then the lady could not think of living life without this boyfriend. Because this boyfriend was a very generous boyfriend. He was sending her money and makeup and things and all. Those generous boys. No, I'm not talking of the stingy, stingy ones. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking of the generous, generous ones. Then she's thinking like, when this guy goes, where am I going to get those makeup or those monies and stuff and, you know, so the lady put everything that this boy had uh, bought, put everything together, and went to the parents of the boy. And he says, you see the pills that are in my hands, they were poisonous pills. I'm going to drink all of them here, and I'm going to die here. And the guy was not even there. And the parent says, oh, daughter, what's wrong with oh? What, what, what has gone into your mind? Because your son is leaving me. I cannot even think of living without your son. The only person that you cannot live without is Jesus. <laughs> I can't even think of living without your son. He says, no, 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 no. no. Do not drink this. Go and call our son. So that we can sit you down and we can, ah, I'm not even going to call him. He says he doesn't even want to talk to me. He doesn't want even to see me. I have finalized. <laughs> I am going just to drink all of it. They persuaded her. Oh, our son listened to us. So don't even worry. We'll talk out with our son. And she agreed not to drink. She almost killed herself. And she was not playing games. Oh. She was going to die. Fear. It makes you to make some decisions that are so wrong. I can fight for a marriage, but if you are still dating and uh, you are starting to cheat me and stuff like that, cheerio. I'm not going to die for that. Yes, fear and, and anxiety, they are related. They, word, they, are, they can only be ward off by prayer, petition, thanksgiving, fasting, prayer. If you live in praise, I have, I have noted this in life. When I am just uh, living my life and I'm just listening to the word of God and the word of God and I, when, normally when I'm driving I have a lot of praise songs and I'm just listening to praise songs. There's no situation that looks big to me. Any situation that looks very, very tiny because praise is in me. Our God is fearful in Praise. Ha, when you praise God, when you praise God, when you praise God and he intervenes in your situation, he doesn't only give you what you want. He gives you times 10. When God comes in your situation, he changes your situation. First Peter 5, 7, I'm finishing in a few minutes. Cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. So the Bible knows that you are going to be anxious. At some point in time, you are going to be anxious. But cast your anxiety onto him, for he cares for you. So bring anxiety unto the Lord. Let me give you another one, probably the, as I finish. Another thing that drives fear is hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness, grudge. These are not, con if they are not confessed and repented properly, they create scars in your soul where fear breeds. They create what? Scars in your soul where fear breeds. That's, that's why the Bible says when you are forgiving someone, you are doing yourself favor more than the person that you are forgiving. 
Because if you do not forgive, if you have hatred, bitterness, grudge, and you allow them to fester in your heart, they create scars. And fear and demons, they come to dwell in those scars. The opposite of hatred, unforgiveness, grudge, bitterness is love. Now hear what 1 John 4 verse 18 says. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So I encourage you to forgive. Be a person who is just forgiving. If it's offense, let me tell you, as long as you are alive, you are going to be offended. You can be even offended when I'm preaching here. You can be offended by your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband. Your if there's equal opportunity, employer is offense. You're going to be offended. Well, life is like that. Sometimes you're talking to someone whom you have gone out of your way to help. The very same person who helps says, ah, who, who, who even asked you your help? I could have even done it without your help. I mean, you're going to be offended. But do not allow that to dwell inside of you. Be a person who quickly forgives and forgets. And just like, Lord, I put this in the hands of the Lord. Because if you have a grudge and bitterness and unforgiveness, you're going to have scars that you deal with. The opposite of this is love. Life is a tendency of bringing situations that are seemingly giants. That if you are not careful, you will start to define yourself as a grasshopper. So I want us now to go through our list. You have a list that I've given you. I want you to look at that list again and find out what still grips your fear. Today, I, we are going to confess those things. We are going to repent them. We are going to pray over them. We are going to petition God. We are going to make our request known to, unto the Lord so that he deals with those fears. Some of those fears come from an, in unhealed, unhealed souls. Sometimes because of your past experiences and past trauma, you have scars, and those scars of that trauma once in a while visits you. If you have once lost a loved one, you find out that your soul is, and if your soul is not yet healed from losing a loved one, you experience fear, and you are afraid of accident. Because, you know, the fear of death, the fear of injury of a loved one, the fear of terminal illness, there are some people who always think like, I don't think I'm going to live long. I don't think I'll be in old age. I, I, I think I'm just going to die early. If one of your relatives lost the mind in the past, you find out that you deal with the fear of insanity, fear of Saturn, fear of evil spirits. But what is interesting is that most people, they are afraid of the future more than anything. The majority of people are afraid of what? The future, more than snakes, more than scorpions. We are afraid of the future. We are afraid of failure. That's one thing that the majority of people are afraid of. Future, failure, the opinion of other people. We are so much afraid of what people say about me, what people think about me, and we are afraid of public speaking. The future, failure, opinion of other people, and public speaking. Let me help someone here. Do not be afraid of the opinion of other people. Guess what? People will always have opinion about you, including your grave. I told you that example three weeks ago. People are always going to have what? Opinion. Let them keep their own opinion. There's someone who thinks that, ha, ah, this pastor is kind of short like Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and Benjamin, we are, we are, we are twins. Yeah. <laughs> if this pastor was just as tall as Aaron, he would be handsome. Guess what? With my shortness, I find the best girl. <laughs> Brother Aaron, you need to sit down. <laughs> Brother Aaron even stood up like I'm tall. Don't be afraid of what people think about you. That's one thing that you are not supposed to be afraid of. 
Think about whatever you can think about me. This is not going to change anything. As long as I am in the Lord, it is going to be well with me. So do not allow the opinions of other people to stand on your way. Do not be afraid of the future. Let me tell, 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 tell you, the future does not belong in your hands. The Bible says, if you worry like that, can you even increase your hair by even a kibit because of worry? Worrying cannot add anything. Worrying has no value in a child of God. Worrying is not helpful. Worrying makes you to make wrong decisions. Worrying makes you to be paralyzed. You lack imagination because of worry. So do not be worried about the future. The future belongs to my God, and my God cares for me. So why should I be afraid of the future? I say my future is good. Yes, my future is in the hands of the Lord. I will move from glory to glory. Things are just only going to become better and better and better. They are not going to retrogress. Things are only going to progress. When our children were born, both of them, they were like few inches. They were small and little ones. Over the years, they have never become smaller and smaller and smaller. As much as they are emptying the fridge, they become taller and taller and taller. I have seen them growing and growing, and they have become better and better. So what makes me to think, to fear one day, that probably they are going to be a baby again? It will never happen. They will only become bigger and bigger and bigger. Fear of insanity. Because, you know, auntie told you that, oh, in our family, you know, we had that uncle who lost his mind, and we have this other auntie who lost his mind. So, you know, insanity kind of runs in our bloodline. Then you are thinking that we are the next. And you are always thinking that you are the next. And when you are dreaming, you are always dreaming insanity. And it makes you to be afraid even more. Ladies who have been raped, sexually molested, or jilted. Sometimes they struggle with the fear of men, fear of marriage, fear of divorce, or fear of people who are in positions of authority. There's another fear of people. People who are in positions of what? Authority. Especially if they have been mistreated by someone in the position of authority. You are always afraid of that. So it now creates scars in your heart. And in those scars, that's where fear lives. Psalm 23, verse 1 and 3 says, The Lord is my shepherd. He restores my soul. We pray today for the healing of the emotions, of the mind, and of the will, which is the restoration of the soul. If the soul can be restored, it means that it was in its original position, it was okay. Then something happened to the soul. So now... He is working on restoring the soul from where it is to back where it was. So God can heal our emotions. God can heal our mind. God can heal our will. I want you to know that fear sometimes points out to the powers that are following you. This is important. Sometimes fear points out to what? The powers that are following you. You must contend against them until you overcome them. Let me tell you how fear comes in dreams. If you are sometimes being pursued by, let's say, a marine spirit, you always dream trying to cross a river. And a huge anaconda comes. And you wake up when you are surrounded by this. And you wake up, you know, you are sweating and you are scared. Then next week or a week after, you dream you are trying to drink water from the river and something come and bite you. And you can see over time that there's a trend of dreams of water and something doesn't go away. So your dreams are actually showing you, are indicating to you what are things that you are supposed to address. And unfortunately, people react to that with fear rather than with strength. You are just supposed to say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, you have given me power and authority. You are the creator of the rivers and everything in the waters. You are the creator of the heavenlies and everything thereof. 
So today I bind any marine spirit from where I come from that has been following me. The next time that I am crossing a river, you are going to give me a boat to cross by. Declare a thing and it will be established. I was struggling at some point in time in my life. I always see a python whenever I am about to do something important. I'm about to go for an interview. I'm about to go for a visa interview. I'm about to go for something that is important. As I'm walking in a path, I see a snake. Sometimes I see a snake on top of the tree. And I remember so much afraid. I, I, I grew up killing snakes. I, I'm a village boy. I grew up killing snakes. I'm a bold guy. But in my dreams, it, they were reflecting something different. And I, I, when I come to understand that, yeah, perhaps there is some, something which was done by a serpentine spirit. I have to deal with that serpentine spirit. So I made a covenant with the Lord. I fasted for some days. And after fasting, I said, Lord, I gave something to the Lord. It was just between me and the Lord. And I said, any time that I will see a snake in the dream, I must kill it. If it runs away, I must dream it again so that I will kill it. So this is what happens after that. I started to have dreams of snakes that are exaggerated. You know, a snake that is just as good as a, a big, like an SUV, coming against my way. And I would just see, from nowhere, just have a rock. And I said, in the name of Jesus, once that snake is hit, it would just desperate, just to, 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 to dissolve. And after that, any snake dream that I had, I had to kill it. I had to kill it. I knew that now I'm using the authority that I have. You have that. Authority that I have in Christ Jesus to overcome any serpentine spirit. For the Bible says we shall tread upon the scorpions and the snakes. There are some people who dream and you dream over and dream over and you see a, a, a lion following you. You know, and you are always being chased by a lion. There are two lions in the Bible. One of the lion, it is the devil comes to you rolling like a lion. That's the first lion. Then there is a lion of the tribe of Judah. So when you see a lion in the dream, it's either of the two. One of them chases the other. That's the good news. So if you dream, you're always running away from a, a lion. You're always running away from a lion. Know that this is an evil demonic lion, which is the devil. So call the lion of the tribe of Judah in your prayer. And you say, now I send you lion of the tribe of Judah against this lion that is rolling and coming against me. And go after it. We will see the next time there will be a lion that will chase a lion. And that's the end of those dreams. Instead of waking up from a dream afraid, I want to teach you something as I'm finishing up right now. The dream does not have a final say. I repeat, the dream does not have a final say. The dream can only have a final say probably if you die in the dream. As long as you wake up, the dream does not have a final say. You have the final say. So you dreamt you were beaten by a snake. Then I wake up. When I wake up, I will take anointing oil. I anoint the place where the snake bite me. I raise my hands unto the Lord. I sing the blood of Jesus. I now command with authority that I was given by Christ Jesus. I said, any venom that has been released into my body, my soul, or my spirit, hear the voice of the Lord. I command you by fire, come out of me. Loose hold and leave because I have authority. Then the next thing now, I call the fire of God to locate wherever that serpent is gone. And I call the fire of God to burn that serpent to ashes. So I have the final say. Do not be a person who is paralyzed by dreams. Because dreams are showing you what's happening in the spirit world. And all what you need to do is what? To address them. I know sometimes you dream your, your wife leaving, your wife leaving, those who are married, your wife leaving. And now you are so scared. Oh my goodness, she's going to leave me. One day that you arrive home and your wife is not home because she's buying some things. You are calling, honey, where are you? Is everything okay with you? You are, you are living in fear. Do not live in fear. The dream does not mean what you see. Dream needs to be interpreted. 
Let me finish with this. Dreams need to be interpreted. Brother, Pastor Paul, if Pastor Paul dreamed me fighting him, he doesn't need to start to hate me and to avoid me. He needs to find out what does that mean. Because there's a person who is called Jacob and he contented with God and he prevailed against God. So find out what, why you are fighting with your pastor. Is, is your life in order? Is there something wrong? You don't think that the next time that I see Pastor Arnold, I have to be in a distance, probably he's going to punch me. No, they are not literal. They are spiritual. I want you to understand this because I know people who made some decisions bad decisions because of a dream. If there's a spirit that does not want you to get married, when you have a boyfriend, you're about to get married, you dream having a big squabble. Then you'll be like, oh, oh, the Lord has already told me. I have to leave him. No, 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 no. Find what it means. What it means, it could be the power from where you come from. That does not want you to be settled. So you have to understand the dream. You cannot only act from the dream itself. Because the dreams, sometimes they can show you some things that are very strange. But what is the Lord saying in this dream? What is the interpretation? What is the meaning? That's why Joseph was interpreting what? Dreams. They did not take it literally. They find what are these symbols and what it means. Let me finish up. The last thing. Job 3 that we read, 23 to 26. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at easy, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. I want us to pray sometime soon and ask the Lord to take away our fears. I want us, the Lord, to take away the fears. God said, do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Joshua 1.9, it says, If I not commanded you, be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Psalm 34.4, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from my fears. We want the Lord to deliver us from our fears. I want you to stand up with your paper. I want you to stand up with your paper.